Hey everybody, it's Miss Elizabeth and I am back to continue the Spiderwick Chronicles by um, Tony Dieterlizzi and Holly Black. So we just finished the second one, book two, uh, which was The Seeing Stone recently. And I now have book three, which is called Lucinda's Secret. Yay! So Spiderwick Chronicles, Book three, Lucinda's Secret, um, by Tony Dieterlizzi and Holly Black, and uh, published by Simon & Schuster Books for Young Readers. So, of course, um, when we ended the last one, the Grace children had um, escaped from the goblins. They had rescued an injured griffin and brought it to the carriage house at, their, their, um, at the um, Spiderwick estate. And it's, it appears that Jared has made Thimbletack angry. Probably because he wrestled the stone away from him instead of um, cooperating with him. And we know how much of a pain Thimbletack was in the first book when he got mad. So that is where we left off at the end of book two so let us see what book three is going to bring us but of course first i do have to show you the lovely lovely book plate at the beginning um pretty pretty illustration this one is labeled her whole body began to tremble look at that mm, looks like a unicorn which is cool so lots of good things to look forward to all right, so let us go on and dive in here, get into the beginning page. All right, chapter one, which is called In Which Many Things Are Turned Inside Out. And here is the illustration. Do, do, do. <clears throat> Jared Grace took out a red shirt, turned it inside out, and put it on backward. He tried to do the same with his jeans, but that was beyond him. Arthur Spiderwick's field guide to the fantastical world around you lay atop his pillow, open to a page on protective devices. Jared had consulted the book carefully, not sure any of it would help much. Since the morning after the Grace kids had returned with the griffin, Thimbletack had been out to get Jared. Every so often, he could hear the little brownie in the wall. At other times, Jared thought he saw him out of the corner of his eye. Mostly, though, Jared had just wound up the victim of some new prank. So far, his eyelashes had been cut, his shoes had been filled with mud, and something had urinated on his pillow. Mom blamed Simon's new kitten for the last, but Jared knew better. Mallory was completely unsympathetic. Now you know how it feels, she kept saying. <clears throat> only Simon seemed to be, only Simon seemed at all concerned. And he practically had to be. If Jared hadn't forced Thimbletack to give up the seeing stones, Simon might have been roasted over a spit in a goblin camp. Jared tied the laces of his muddy shoe over an inside-out sock. He wished that he could find a way to apologize to Thimbletack. He had tried to give, the ba give back the stone, but the brownie hadn't wanted it. The thing was, he knew that if everything were to happen all over again, he would do exactly what he had done. Just thinking about Simon being held by goblins, while Thimbletack stood around talking in riddles, made Jared angry enough to almost break his laces with the force of the knot. Jared, Mallory called from downstairs, Jared, come here a minute. He stood up, tucking the guide under his arm, and took a step toward the stairs. He fell immediately, hitting his hand and knee against the hardwood floor. Somehow, Jared's shoelaces had been tied together. Downstairs, Mallory was standing in the kitchen, holding a glass up to the window so that the water caught the sunlight and cast a rainbow on the wall. Simon sat next to her. Both of Jared's siblings seemed transfixed. Here we go. The water caught the sunlight. What? Jared said. He was feeling grumpy and his knee hurt. If all they wanted was to show him how pretty the stupid glass looked, he was going to break something. Take a sip. Mallory said, handing the glass to him. Jared eyed it suspiciously. Did they spit in it? Why would Mallory want him to drink water? Go ahead, Jared, Simon said. We already tried it. 
The microwave beeped and Simon jumped up to remove a giant mound of chopped meat. The top part was a sickly gray, but the rest of it still looked frozen. What's that? Jared asked, peering at the meat. For Byron, Simon said, dumping it into a huge bowl and adding cornflakes. He must be getting better. He's always hungry. Jared grinned. Anyone else would be wary of a half-starved griffin recuperating in their carriage house. Not Simon. Go on, Mallory said. Drink. Jared took a sip of the water and choked. The liquid burned his mouth and he spat half of it onto the tile floor. The rest slid down his throat like fire. Are you crazy? He yelled between bouts of coughing. What was that? Water from the tap, Mallory said. It all tastes that way. Then why did you make me drink it? Jared demanded. Mallory crossed her arms. Why do you think all this stuff is happening? What do you mean? Jared asked. I mean that weird things started happening when we found that book, and they're not going to stop until we get rid of it. Weird stuff was happening before we found it, Jared objected. It doesn't matter, Mallory said. Here's a picture of Simon preparing, preparing the breakfast for Griffin. For Griffin. Those goblins wanted the guide. I think we should give it to them. The room was silent for a few seconds. Finally, Jared managed a hushed. What? We should get rid of that stupid book, Mallory repeated, before someone gets hurt, or worse. We don't even know what's wrong with the water, Jared glared at the sink, anger coiling in his gut. Who cares, Mallory said. Remember what Thimbletack told us? Arthur's field guide is too dangerous. Jared didn't want to think about Thimbletack. We need the guide, he said. We wouldn't have ever even known there was a brownie in the house without it. We wouldn't have known about the troll or the goblins or anything. And they wouldn't know about us, Mallory said. It's mine, Jared said. Stop being so selfish, Mallory shouted. Jared clenched his teeth. How dare she call him selfish? She was just too chicken to keep it. I decide what happens to it, and that's final. I'll show you final, Mallory took a step toward him. If it wasn't for me, you'd be dead. So, Jared said, if it wasn't for me, you'd be dead right back. Mallory took a deep breath. Jared could almost imagine steam coming out of her nose. Exactly. We could all be dead because of that book. The three of them looked down at that book dangling from Jared's left hand. He turned to Simon, furious. I suppose you agree with her. Simon shrugged uncomfortably. The guide did help us figure out about Thimbletack and about the stone that lets you see into fairy. Jared smiled in triumph. But, Simon went on and Jared's face fell, what if there are more goblins out there? If we don't, if I, I don't know if we could stop them. What if they got in the house or grabbed mom? Jared shook his head. If Mallory and Simon destroyed the guide, then everything they'd done would have been for nothing. What if we give back the guide and they keep coming after us? Why would they do that? Mallory demanded. We'd still know about the guide, said Jared, and we'd still know fairies are real. They might think we'd make another guide. This picture it says, we need the guide. I'd make sure you didn't, said Mallory. Jared turned to Simon, who was pushing a wooden spoon through the half-frozen mess of meat and cereal. And what about the griffin? The goblins wanted Byron, didn't they? Are they going? Are we going to give him back too? No, said Simon, looking out of the faded curtains into the yard. We can't let Byron go. He isn't all the way better. No one is looking for Byron, Mallory said. It isn't the same thing at all. Jared tried to think of something that would convince them, something that would prove that they needed the guide. He didn't understand the fairies any more than Simon or Mallory did. He didn't even know why the fairies would still would want the field guide when the only thing in it was stuff about them. Did the fairies just not want people to see it? The only person who might know the answer was Arthur, and he was long dead. Jared stopped at that thought. There is someone we could ask. Someone who really might know what to do, Jared said. Who? asked Simon and Mallory in unison. Jared had won. The book was safe, at least for now. He smirked. Aunt Lucinda. Ooh. So, this is chapter two in which many people are mad. 
in the beginning picture is it looked more like a manor than an asylum. It's very sweet of you kids to want to visit your great aunt, Mom said, smiling into the rear view mirror at Jared and Simon. I know she's going to love the cookies you made. Outside the car window, the trees streamed by, patches of yellow and red leaves between bare branches. They didn't make them, Mallory said. All they did was arrange frozen dough on a pan. Jared kicked the back of her seat hard. Hey, Mallory said, turning around and trying to grab her brothers. Jared and Simon snickered. She couldn't quite get them with her seatbelt on. Well, that's more than you did, their mother said. You were still grounded, young lady. All three of you have a week left. I was at fencing practice, Mallory said, slumping in her seat and rolling her eyes. Jared wasn't sure, but it seemed like there was something odd about the way her ears got pink when she said it. Jared absently touched his backpack, feeling the outline of the field guide within, safe and sound, wrapped in a towel. So, so long as he kept it with him, there was no way that Mallory could get rid of it and no way the fairies could take it. Besides, maybe Aunt Lucinda knew about the guide. Maybe she was the one who had locked it up in the false bottom of the chest for him to find. If so, maybe she could convince his brother and sister that it was important enough to keep. There's a picture of them in the car. The hospital where their great aunt lived was huge. It looked more like a manor than an asylum with massive red brick walls, dozens of windows, and a neatly mown lawn. A wide white stone path edged in rust and gold mums led to an entranceway cut from stone. At least 10 chimneys rose from the black roof. Wow, this place looks older than our house, Simon said. Older, said Mallory, but not nearly as crappy. Mallory, their mother cautioned. Gravel crunched under their tires as they pulled into the parking lot. Their mother chose a spot next to a battered green car and turned off the engine. Does Aunt Lucy know we're coming? Simon asked. I called ahead, said Mrs. Grace, opening the car door and reaching for her purse. I don't know how much they tell her, though, so don't be disappointed if she's not expecting us. I bet we're the first visitors she's had in a long time, Jared said. His mother gave him a look. First of all, that is not a nice thing to say, and second, why are you wearing your shirt inside out? Jared looked down and shrugged. Grandma visits, doesn't she? Mallory asked. Their mother nodded. She comes, but it's hard for her. Lucy was more like a sister than a cousin. Here's a picture of Jared. <laughs> and then when she started to deteriorate, Grandma was the one who had to take care of things. Jared wanted to ask what that meant, but something made him hesitate. They walked through the wide walnut doors of the institution. There was a desk in the vestibule where a, where a uniformed man was sitting, reading a newspaper. He looked up at them and reached for a tan phone. Sign in, please, he nodded toward an open binder. Who are you here to see? Lucinda Spiderwick. Their mother bent over the table and wrote their names. At the sound of the name, the man scowled. Jared decided right then that he didn't like this guy at all. In a few minutes, a nurse in a pink shirt with polka dots appeared. She led them through a maze off of, uh, of off-white hallways filled with stale air and the faint odor of iodine. They passed an empty room where a television flickered, and from somewhere nearby there was the sound of giddy laughter. Jared started to think of the asylums and movies and imagined wild-eyed people in straitjackets biting at their bonds. He peered through the windowed doors they passed. In one room, a young man in a bathroom giggled over an upside-down book, while in another, a woman sobbed near a window. Jared tried to avert his eyes from the next door, but he heard someone call, My dancing partner is here. Peering in, he saw a wild-haired man press his face against the window. Mr. Byrne, the nurse stepped between Jared and the door. It's all your fault, the man said, showing yellow teeth. Are you okay? Mallory asked. Jared nodded, trying to pretend he wasn't shaking. Does that happen often? Mrs. Grace asked. No, answered the nurse. I'm very sorry. He's usually very quiet. Before Jared could decide whether this visit was a good idea, the nurse stopped at a closed door, rapped twice, and opened it without waiting for, waiting for a reply. The room was small and the same not quite white color as the hallway. In the center of the room was a hospital bed with a metal headboard, and sitting up in it with a comforter wrapped around her legs was one of the oldest women Jared had ever seen. Her long hair was as white as sugar. Her skin was pale, too, almost transparent. Her back was hunched and twisted to one side. A metal stand by the side of her bed held a bag of clear liquid with a long tube that connected to the IV in her arm. 
but her eyes, when they focused on Jared, were bright and alert. So, I think they're meeting Great Aunt Lucy, Lucinda. And I think that might be a good spot to stop for today and um, make y'all guys wait for the exciting stuff. So, there is a picture of Aunt Lucinda to close off with. All right, thank you for joining me for the beginning of book three, and I will be back again soon to continue. All right, until then, have a good night. Bye.